Once again, thank you for being here this evening as we've been continuing on with this lectureship for The Bible Tells Me So. We have, uh, first on the docket, we have the authority demands Bible submission. We've been, we've been leading up to this moment where we understand that the Bible is the authority of God's word. We understand that it is the revelation of God's will. And knowing all that, what do we do about it? And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight in both lessons. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I love hanging out with this brother and all of our brothers that have came. Uh, I'm going to tell real quick, I'll, I'll let you have your preaching time, I promise. We were at Brenda's Cafe this morning and everything else, and, and sure enough, that lovely waitress, she looked, she goes, y'all aren't from around here. I'm like, that's, my favorite part was when they asked Ben where he was from, and I was like, oh, this is great, because Ben's a local now. But one of the things that we explained is like, oh, they're here for preaching, and, and they're here, you know, as a, on a lectureship. And they're like, well, where's this happening? And, and like fashion, you have Jason, he goes, oh, always on him, somewhere. <laughs> and he just smiles, and she goes, may I put it up? Please do. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. He's passionate about God's word. He loves God's word. I'm going to tell you right now, tonight, you're going to hear God's word preached. And it's one of those things that sometimes we take it for granted, or sometimes we hear things and we're like, how can that be? But it is God's word. And one thing I know about this brother is God's word will be proclaimed tonight. And so come preach the word, brother. Told you all about the little boy the other day that wanted to grow up and be a preacher. You know, he said that he'd rather get up there and yell than have to sit there and listen. Well, this same little boy, you know, kept getting in trouble. One day he was in services. He had snuck a cap gun in, and he shot that cap gun off. Pow! Made a loud noise. Of course, his mama grabbed him up in proverbial fashion, took him to the back to give him some instruction. Preacher stopped, stopped her and said, ma'am, said, listen. Said, there's no need to whip that boy. Said, he scared the devil out of more people today than I have in a month. <laughs> Same little boy was, um, you know, in trouble all the time. And so the, the mother talked to the preacher and said, can you talk to my son, a little Johnny, and, and tell him, you know, he's got to quit acting like this or he's going to be in trouble. So this little boy, five, six years old, he goes into the preacher. And the preacher says, son, where is God? The little boy's eyes were big, and he didn't say a word. He said, son, I ask you a question. I said, where is God? Third time, he asked him the question. Well, after the third time the preacher asked that question in this deep, booming voice, the little boy just took off out the door. I mean, took off out the door, ran home, got in the closet, and put his little brother in there with him, who was about four, four years old or so. And uh, the little brother said, well, what are you doing? What are we doing? He said, listen. He said, I'm in trouble and, and, and the preacher asked me, where is God? They think I took him. <laughs> well, enough of that. We're glad that you're here tonight. I want to tell you about another boy, but that's, uh, this is not a made-up story. This is real. This young man was 18 years of age, and he was on top of a tin barn in the summertime in Texas, over 100 degrees, and he made up his mind, and he said, you know, he said, I'm either going to live for God or I'm going to live for myself. But he understood that one day he would face God in judgment. And of course, that boy was myself. Each of us have to make a decision about where we want to spend our eternity. God is good. And the Bible says His goodness leads us to repentance. Romans 2 and verse number 4. God is good because He's given us free will. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says, Know ye not. To whom ye yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are. Whether of sin unto death, there's choice one. Or obedience unto righteousness, there's choice two. But God be thanked. You were the servants of sin because you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you. And doing that, you've been then made free from sin. Romans 6, 16 to 18. You know, Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. God is good, and He's given us free will, free will to make a choice. And tonight our lesson is entitled, That the Authority of the Bible Demands Submission. The Authority of the Bible Demands Submission. This same theme of freedom of will is all the way back in the Old Testament. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. I hope you have your Bibles tonight. You're going to need them. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 to 28. 
You know, I don't understand why some don't bring Bibles. The problem with some of these electric Bibles is you can't hear if the pages are turning. <laughs> but I like the old-fashioned Bibles. You can hear those pages turning. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. He says, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day. If you go down to the end of verse 29, you have something referenced here, this blessing about, upon Mount Gerizim and a curse upon, upon Mount Ebal. Now with that in mind, turn over to the 27th chapter of the same book, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 27. And notice chapter 27 of Deuteronomy, and I want you to read with me, beginning, if you will, in verse 1, Deuteronomy 27, 1. And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep, how much? All the commandments which I command you this day. And it shall be on the day that when you shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. Watch this. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law which thou art passed over, and that thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Go down to verse number 8. He says, And thou shalt write upon these stones all the words of this law. How? Very plainly. Words. What is a word? Well, a word is a vehicle of thought. So God has given us, given us words. In the Old Testament, they had words. We're under the New Testament. We learn from the Old, Romans 15, 4. But we have these words, these vehicles of thought, which give us God's mind revealed to men. And we have the topic tonight that the authority of the Bible demands submission. We have free will. We can make a choice. You can make a choice tonight about what you believe. It doesn't matter if you agree with me. It matters what does the Bible teach. I'm either teaching the truth or I'm not teaching the truth. And if I'm not, you need to come show me where I'm teaching error. And if I am, let's follow it together. Now, here's how we're going to approach this lesson in the 35 minutes we have. We're going to look at the Bible. Number one is authoritative. Number two, the Bible is or demands submission. Number three, the Bible is used or will be used in judgment. So I can't move around because we're going to have a lapel, so I've got to stay in the pulpit, which is difficult. But the Bible is authoritative, demands submission, will be used in judgment. Let's get started. Number one, the Bible is authoritative. Now, before I get to the single standard of authority, that's the Bible, I want to talk about some sinful standards of authority. If the authority of the Bible demands submission, we need to understand there are some sinful standards of authority men appeal to. Someone says, Jason, what do you mean? Number one, human philosophy. People appeal to human philosophy. Jeremiah 10, 23, however, says, It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You could also go to 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. In fact, I, let's just do that. I'll take the time. I'm going to get in trouble if I start going to some of these passages, and, but I, I, I've got to do it because I want to show you the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, we find the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So sometimes people say, well, I don't think I believe that. And it doesn't matter what we believe. It matters what does the Bible say. And so you go all the way down, verse 21. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. That's the way the world looks at it, foolishness. To them, to save them that believe. Look at verse number 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I wish I had time to stay in this text even longer. But I want you to go to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Wow, Colossians chapter 2. What a passage we have in Colossians. 
You know, when you study the Bible, you realize all the books of the Bible have a theme. Philippians, joy. Colossians, Christ. Ephesians, the church. Revelation, victory. And we could go on and on. But in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8, notice what we find. He says here, beware lest any man spoil you through, what's our point? False standards of authority, human philosophy. He said, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, that's the love of wisdom, human wisdom, and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Go back to verse um, number 4 in Colossians 2. He says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you. That phrase, any man, is used a lot in this text. We just read that it's used again in verse 8, verse 16, verse 8. Any man. Lest any man should beguile you. Para lo, uh, lo, Logizomai, which is the idea, para is beside or near, logizomai is to reason. And so, it's, it's, so what he's saying is, don't let a man take you to the side and reason falsely with you. It says beguiling you with enticing words or persuasive speech. There are people who can use the wisdom of this world to make something sound really good, but it's false. Let me tell you where you find the answers. Look at verse 3. Here's the problem. People don't know verse 3. In whom, this is in Jesus, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So people get caught up in the philosophies of men. Think about situation ethics. How many of you have heard of Joseph Fletcher? Fletcher, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've heard of Joseph Fletcher. Okay, that scares me. Two people. Joseph Fletcher is the father of situation ethics. And he, many years ago, began to write about how situations can vary if something's right or if something's wrong. I can remember when I was in college and um, taking a class, and this was brought up. They didn't call it situation ethics, but that's what it was. And they gave a scenario. They said, look, your wife has a dreaded disease. She has cancer, and there's a cure. But the cure costs a lot of money. You don't have enough money, but you know how to break into the building where this cure is, and you know how to get it. You could steal it and even get away with it. What do you do? I remember raising my hand, and I said, my wife's going to die. The teacher wasn't expecting that answer. What she was expecting is that situation would make it okay to steal. Friends, it is never right to do wrong. Human philosophy is not a standard of authority. What about popular opinion? Oh, I know what, is, I know what Exodus 23, 2 says. Don't follow a multitude to do evil. Jesus said, and always will, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, He says, narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Popular opinion doesn't work. You know, you talk about popular opinion. How popular is John 14, 6 if you're a Buddhist or a, or a Muslim or a Hindu? By the way, that, that involves hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions or billions of people. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation given among heaven under any other name. There's no other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. You see, Jesus and the Word of God teaches something right, and it's always right. Popular opinion doesn't change that. Number three, you've got to hurry on. Family and friends. How many people are going to be lost because they follow their family and friends? I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people even in the church going to be lost because of family and friends. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 34, He is the Prince of Peace, but the Prince of Peace said, I came not to bring peace. He came to bring the peace that passes understanding, but that peace that passes understanding causes some to reject it, and therefore there's also not peace in another way. And he says, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew 10, 34 and following. He goes on and said, if a man loves his father or mother more than me, he is not worthy of me. Matthew 10, about verse 37. So when we think about family and friends, we need to understand that is not the standard of what is right or wrong. Have you ever read Deuteronomy 13 regarding idolatry? Who was to be the first one to take up a rock 
and take out their own family. It was family members. Deuteronomy 13, 1 and following. No, God wants us to love our family, but not to love them more than himself. Now, there is a family greater than your physical family. It's the family of God. Read Mark 10, 28 and following. He goes on and says, in this life, you can have all of these things, but it's going to be in the kingdom, in the gospel, for the gospel, sometimes with persecutions, Mark 10, 28 and following. No, family and friends can't be the standard of what's right or wrong. What about religious leaders? <laughs> Again, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. For there are many false prophets gone out into the world. And then you think about Matthew 7, 15. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in, in, with, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. What does a false teacher look like? A false teacher looks like a true teacher, except for he's false. The difference is what he says. You know them by their fruits, Matthew 7 and verse number 20. You have to be a fruit inspector. You cannot say, well, he's nice. He drives a nice car. He has a shiny Bible and a pretty wife and decent kids and a nice dog. That doesn't determine truth. You know, the sinful standards of authority involve religious false teachers. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And on and on we could go with various scriptures. I do want to uh, give you one more passage. Proverbs 14, 15. That passage says, The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man, the wise man, looketh well to his goings. You know, we, we've got caught up in a culture that believes that if a man has a Ph.D. or an MDiv or a theology degree, then he knows more than I know. But I just read you the passage in Colossians 2, 3. It says all wisdom is in Jesus Christ. All wisdom and knowledge. So a man comes up to me and he has a Ph.D. Fine, I'm not against a Ph.D. I've had six years of formal education after high school. I graduated college magna cum laude, whatever that means. Who cares? I've known good men in the church who have higher degrees. I've known men who have higher degrees that I wouldn't give two cents for what they think as well as men who have no degrees that are on both sides of the spectrum. The key is, what does the Bible say? False teachers are everywhere, but they're not the standard. One more, and we'll go to the, the next point. Personal feelings. Personal feelings. You know, in 2 Kings 5.11, Naaman came to this water, and what did he say? That famous phrase, behold, I Remember Naaman, he was told to dip in a certain river seven times. And he said, well, why can't I dip in these other rivers? Behold, I thought. A little old girl came out to him finally said, what are you doing? Said, if he had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you do it? Why don't you do what he says? It's not that difficult. Go read 2 Kings 5 later when you get home. Brethren, this is a matter of the heart. The biblical heart, I wish I could preach a whole sermon on this. Maybe sometime I will. The biblical heart is composed of intellect. Emotion, conscience, and free will. God gave us free will. I've already covered that point. Intellect is the information that goes in the mind or the conscience. But let me tell you something. Your conscience won't work right unless the information in the intellect is correct. So in Proverbs 4.23, the Proverbs writer says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So you begin to study the scriptures. A man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The, the heart thinks. The heart, that's where the intellect goes in. But if the intellect and the information is not according to the word of God, remember false teachers? Your conscience may feel real good, but you're wrong. That's why Paul said in Acts 23, 1, he said, I've lived in all good conscience even up to this day. Now, wait a minute. Paul had murdered Christians. He had murdered Christians, Acts 8 and 9. But in Acts 23, 1, he says, I still have a clean conscience. How could he have a clean conscience, now as a Christian, knowing, and he says, I've, I've had a clean conscience the whole time, even though he murdered people. Because when he murdered them, you go read about Paul, he thought he was doing God's will. In other words, his inf the information in his mind was wrong. So what he did never caused him to have guilt until he got the correct information. Boom, he realized he was lost. And he arose and washed away his sins through the act of baptism, Acts twenty-two sixteen. 16. 
You may leave here tonight and say, my conscience isn't bothering me. Well, let me tell you something. That either means you've hardened your conscience, which is also possible, or it might mean that your conscience isn't bothering you because you are doing what the Word of God says, or you have an ignorant conscience, and so it's not working properly. Listen, personal feelings, that's a big deal. We need to understand Mark chapter 7, out of the heart proceeds fornication, envy, lust, all the things listed there in Mark chapter 7. But what does Luke 8 say? But they with a good heart, having heard the word of God, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. So we have these sinful standards of authority, and then we have this single standard of authority, which is the Word of God. I don't have time to cover all of this. Um, our good brother did it last night in 1 John, but I do want to show you just a few things. Go over to 1 John. Mornay covered some of this in 1 John, but brethren, don't miss this. In 1 John, I want to show you very quickly, there's these sinful standards of authority. Then there's the single, which is God's Word, standard of authority. Notice in 1 John 1, verse number 4, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. How can I have full joy based on what's written? I'm either doing it or I'm not. Now notice how many times he uses this word. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you. Go down to verse 3. And hereby do we know that we know him. Verse 4 says, if you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. Verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Verse 7, brethren, I write. Verse 8, again, a new commandment, I write. Verse 12, I write unto you, little children. Verse 13, I write unto you, fathers. Verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers. You keep going throughout this book, go over to chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we know Him that is true. Watch this. And that we are in Him that is true. How do you know if you're in Jesus or not? Because you know what's written, and you've either done it or you had not done it. We could go on and on, but I think you get the point. The point is, the Word of God is this simple, single standard of authority. The problem today is most people don't know the book. So Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 12 and in Matthew chapter 19, over and over, I, I, if I had time, I'd show you all these passages in Matthew like five or six times. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read what the Scripture said? And then in John chapter 5, those false teachers that had rejected him and his miracles, oh, I have the passages, but we don't have time, where he says, if you don't believe me, believe the works that I do, because I am from the Father. And then he says to them in John 5, about verse 39, he says, search the Scriptures. Here's what he's really saying. He's saying, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. What he's saying is you don't even know what the Scriptures teach. Acts 13 and Acts 15, both passages, there's two verses there, that says on the Sabbath day they opened and read the Scripture every Sabbath day. But they didn't know what, what it taught. It's not enough to read the Bible. We have to study and know what the Bible teaches. It is a single standard of authority, and we can know it if we put the time and diligence and effort in. Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jason, what does that mean? The verse right above it, Psalm 119, 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. You want to know why Jesus in Mark 3, 5 looked upon people with anger because of the hardness of their hearts? Because he was a man of the book. Deuteronomy is quoted three times in Matthew 4. Satan came and tempted him. And Jesus didn't use human philosophy. He didn't use the reasoning of men. He didn't say, fetch me someone with a PhD. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Brethren, that's what's happened to the church over the last number of decades. We have gotten away from godly, biblical, st uh, 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 specific, detailed preaching. And that's caused great harm in the church. 
Isaiah chapter 8. Oh, brethren, let it ring in our ears. Isaiah 8 in verse number 20. To the law and to the testimony. If any man speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in him. That then reminds me of Isaiah 5 and 20. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good, that put light for darkness and darkness for light, sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Do we live in a world today that has mixed things up? Oh, you know we have live in a world today that has mixed things up. They've changed the language of God to the language of the world. So he says, well, what do you mean? It's no longer, it's no longer a, a murder, it's abortion. It's no longer fornication, it's living together or cohabitation. It's no longer sodomy, it's alternative lifestyle or LGBTQ2S+. It's no longer men and women. It's whatever transitional thoughts you want to have at the time. But this has been going on for a long time. In the denominational world, when they say church, they mean divisions. They mean part of the church, this denomination, that denomination, this denomination, all composing the one church of the New Testament, which is contrary to the very nature of the one church, and, by the way, is described as heresies in the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. So they've missed, they've missed the word church up. Faith, they call it a blind leap in the dark. The Bible teaches that it's based on evidence. They say belief or faith doesn't involve obedience, but Jesus clearly didn't believe that because he said in John 14, 15, if you, believe, if you, if you um, love me, keep my commandments. He said in Luke 6, 46, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? In Hebrews 5, 9 rings in my ear where it says that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Someone says, Jason, why are you quoting all these verses? Because the authority of the Bible demands submission. And until we understand there's a single standard of authority that's opposed to these false, sinful standards of authority. We are going to continue to have problems over and over again, and we don't want that. I want to tell you something. The Word of God is simple. Yes, it's complex and deep. I'm, I understand that. But it's also simple in the, in the basic things, how to become a Christian, how to live a Christian life, moral issues, marriage, the home. Those are not difficult things. Take your Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 2. Let me just show you how simple this thing is. Genesis chapter 2 and uh, verse number 15. Or, or 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It's pretty clear. So Satan comes along in chapter 3. And he says in verse number 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, now if you read the next few verses, she knew exactly what God said and quotes it. And then the serpent said in verse 4, You shall not surely die. See how simple, or how simple that is. God said, Don't touch it. But how, how the devil works, he changed one word, said it's okay, you won't die. She does it, and they die. They begin the physical dying process. They die spiritually. You then have that animal sacrifice that we see given this coats of skins and the scheme of redemption because of God's love for us that's put into place. But I want you to understand something. The Word of God is not that hard when it comes to basics. Brother, someone says, Jason, Jason, what do you mean? Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, you have the sons of Aaron. They offered strange or unauthorized fire. God said, get the fire over here. They got the fire from a different source, and they offered a sacrifice according to their own thoughts, not according to the pattern of God. And if you read Leviticus 12, or 10, 1 and 2, God smote them dead. You ever studied about Uzzah? Uzzah touched the ark, didn't he? God said, God said to Uzzah, don't touch the ark. Someone says, where did God say that to us? In Numbers chapter 4, hundreds of years before us had touched it, God had said they are not to touch it. You get over to 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I believe he had a good heart when he did it. The, the, the cart shook. He reaches up to steady the, the ark of the covenant, and when he does, God strikes him dead like that. Why? Because God had said, don't touch it. When they walked around the walls of Jericho, they had to walk around once a day for every day and then seven times on the seventh day. 
And, and then the walls fell, and the Bible says that they fell by faith after they were compassed about seven days. Well, now, what if they would have not walked around the walls? Well, then they didn't have faith. See, faith is tied to obedience every time. All of these simple things we learn by studying the Old Testament in Hebrews chapter 11. And on and on I could go. But I want to simply say this, and then, and then I want to bring some application before I close. I have something I pulled from my library and put in a sermon I wrote over 20 years ago, but I thought it would be appropriate for tonight. Remember, we're dealing with the authority of the Bible demands submission. Understanding scriptures, following scripture. It says, the group is about to hire a preacher. A candidate for the position arrives, and the one appointed to do most of the interrogating asks him, Do you know the Bible? He responds strongly, Yes, sir. Well, what part do you know the best? Well, I know the story of the Good Samaritan the best. Okay, go ahead and tell it to us. There was a Good Samaritan going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and they sprang up and choked him and left him half dead. And he said, I will arise. And he arose and came to a tree, and he got hung in a limb in the tree. And, and he hung there forty days and forty nights, and the ravens fed him. Delilah, she came along with a pair of shears and cut off his hair, and he fell on the stony ground. And he said, I will arise. And he arose and came to a wall. And Jezebel was sitting on the wall, and she mocked him. And he said, Chunk her down. And they chunked her down. And he said, Chunk her down seventy times seven. And great was the fall thereof. And the fragments that remained, they picked up twelve baskets full. And whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? Then the question is asked, would you hire this man to preach? And this particular brother goes on and says, some of my brethren would. Not only would they hire him to preach, they'd pay him $78,000 a year as long as he has an MDiv or a THD or a PhD. And they just smile as he preaches them right into hell. Friends, we need to understand, we have to realize the Bible is composed of words and we can understand, we can understand logic, we can understand the laws of thought. So I say, Jason, what do you mean the laws of thought? Well, the law of rationality simply says this, we accept only those conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We're talking about the law of identity. So it says, what does that mean? Well, if a proposition is true, then it is true. It cannot be true for one and not true for another in the same context. As an example, in the Christian age, baptism is for the remission of sins. That's either true or it's false. It can't be both ways. You have religious groups that say it's not for the remission of sins. Some that say, or we, we do in the Lord's church, it is for the remission of sins. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. That is a precisely stated proposition. The law of identity means you can't have it both ways. That's not logical. You have the law of excluded middle. That means, again, every precisely stated proposition is true or false. That's excluded middle. For instance, Jesus built his church. That's either true or it's not true. But we know it's true because he did, Matthew 16, 18. What about the, the uh, law of contradiction? No proposition can both be true and false at the same time and in the same respect. For example, the only grounds for scriptural marriage, divorce, and remarriage today is fornication. Proof of that, Matthew 19, 9. So if you say, no, 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 that, that, that's not true. That's not true for us. It's true for some, but not for others. That's impossible. The law of contradiction would say that's impossible. So what I'm saying is when we approach the Bible logically, we understand the authority of Scripture. Let me tell you how simple it is. Think, think about the Lord's worship. Why do we not have a piano in here today? Why do we not have banjos and drums? Someone says, maybe you can't afford them. That, that's not why. There's, there's no authority for their usage. Now, if you say that to the average person, they're like, what do, you, what do you mean there's no authority? That didn't make any sense. It doesn't say not to. Well, wait a minute. Are we living by what the Bible says or doesn't say? Because once you take the approach we live by what the Bible doesn't say, you can introduce anything that you want to introduce, which means when God says something, what's the point of that? Because you can add something anyway. Then, but then, see, we study the Bible, so we know, wait a minute, you can't just add or take away, because Deuteronomy 4, the beginning of the Bible, Proverbs 30, the middle of the Bible, Revelation 21, the, 22, the end of the Bible, says don't add to or take away. When God specifies something, he means what he says. Let's learn from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 6. Noah, build an ark of gopher wood. That means he had to build an ark of gopher wood. God specified that. And so, therefore, if he built it with some other kind of wood then he wouldn't be doing what God said. And if he could do it any way he wanted to, why did God tell him in the first place? We understand authority each and every day. Let me tell you something. The world has gone absolutely crazy 
But I guarantee you 99.9999% of the time you can watch people and men go to the men's restroom and women go to the women's restroom because they know they're a man or a woman. And you know what else? I've never seen a men's restroom sign that says men and underneath not women. It just says men. People know men means men. Men are authorized. What's unauthorized? Anything not a man. That would be a woman. So we, we get this, right? We understand. Think about the next time you go through Dairy Queen or McDonald's or wherever you pull up. Maybe you order this way. I don't think you do. Um, yes, I would like to have a number two with a Dr. Pepper, but I don't want a one. I don't want a three. I don't want a seven. I don't want the chicken nuggets. I don't. Nobody does that. They, you, everybody understands when you say number two, that means number two. That's what's authorized. We get it. On the day of judgment, God could simply hold up a salt shaker and, and the religious world's in trouble. Some say, what? I challenge you to do this sometime. Having a religious discussion, maybe at a restaurant, and you look over to your friend and you say, hey, would you hand me the salt? I guarantee you they're not going to give you the pepper. They're going to hand you the salt without even thinking about it. Because that's what you've authorized and requested. Is God different than that? No. God knows what he wants. He says what he wants. So when I read the New Testament, and I realize in the New Testament, from Matthew to Revelation, all I ever find is that they sang, and that that singing involved congregational, reciprocal, reciprocal singing at the same time, singing that involved teaching, singing that involved admonishing. I realize there's no authority for mechanical instruments of music in worship to God. So it says, oh, but what about Psalm 150? <laughs> Back up the bus. Beep, beep, beep. Back it up. We're not under the Old Testament. We're under the New Testament because when you read Hebrews, Galatians, and other places, you realize, Romans 7, we are under the New. So don't quote the Old to try to justify what's in the New. If you do that, you might as well have three or four wives and start doing animal sacrifices. All I'm simply trying to say as I cover these things is the Bible. This single, simple standard of authority is something we must submit to. It's authority we can understand. The problem is so many of our people, even in the, in the church sometimes, don't stand up for the truth. Brethren, we have to stand up for the truth. I feel like Jude in Jude 3, he said, I wanted to write unto you about the common salvation, but it's needful that I write unto you to earnestly contend. That's the Greek word, there's agonism. To agonism, I agonize. It's, it's needful, I write unto you, to earnestly contend for the faith, which has been once delivered unto the saints, Jude verse 3. Ezekiel twenty two thirty seven. 37. Ezekiel says, I sought for a man to stand in the gap, but I found none. Jeremiah 6 and 16. Seek the old paths, wherein is the good way? And they said, we will not walk therein. Friends and brethren, let me tell you something. I remember that 18-year-old boy on that barn who made his decision up to either follow God or follow man. I'm not saying I know everything and there's times I've had to change in my life. But friends, I'm going to face a God one day in judgment with this sim simple, single standard of authority. And I don't want to use human wisdom, the opinions of family and friends, human philosophy, or any other thing to hold up as why I've done what I've done. I want to have the Word of God that I can rely on so that I can make it into glory. Now, before I end, I do need to say and talk to us a little bit longer about this in the church. You know, it's easy to say, well, you know, we know why we don't have mechanical instruments of music. We know why we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of week, the week because we have an example. The Bible authorizes explicitly or implicitly, explicitly that which is expressly stated, which involves direct statements and approved examples. Acts 20, verse 7, the Lord's Supper, that's an approved example. Uh, also, the Bible authorizes through implication. Implication is that which naturally flows from that which has been expressly stated. So I realize that the Lord's Supper doesn't have to be on the third floor with many lights because that's incidental to the actual commandment, which is coming together to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. I'm just giving you an example. All I'm simply saying is when you take a whole study on authority, it's not that complicated. Silence doesn't authorize, silence forbids. But implication, implication authorizes because it naturally flows from that which has been expressly stated. So you, got to, you have to get precise. Someone says, you need to be baptized. Yes, but what does that mean? Sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? Well, it means immersion. How do you know that? Again, proofs of the Bible. Romans 6, the very nature of the word baptism means immersion. 
It's for the remission of sin. So it's not just get baptized. It's not just get baptized and immersed in water. It's get baptized, immersed in water for the purpose of the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16. I'm getting more and more distinct in my language. You remember how we started out about Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and those plastered stones and they wrote the words of God very plain. Well, that's what we have to make today. It's very plain so that people can read it while they're running. You want to know why there's problems in the church today? Because we haven't made it plain. Brethren, listen. You can't go to heaven and cuss and say dirty words and filthy language. James 3 says that's a sin. You can't, you can't make it to heaven if you want to go to a casino and gamble. So it's how you get in that. Well, Colossians 3 says that covetousness is idolatry. Luke 12 it says, beware of covetousness. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Or how about Matthew 7, 12? What's the purpose of gambling? To take a man's money before he takes yours. That's the opposite of the golden rule of Matthew 7, 12. Okay, fine, I won't gamble, but I'm going to sure drink my beer. I'm going to drink beer. After all, didn't Jesus make alcoholic wine? John chapter 2. If I've heard that once, I've heard that a dozen times from men who have no concept of the Bible. The word wine is a generic word in the old and in the new. Oinos and yoyin. You can go into those words, it's generic, the context has to determine. You go to John 2, they had already drank everything was there. If that's alcohol, our Lord is a bootlegger, a bartender, and he sent a bride and a groom off drunken together. And we have people in the church of Christ who for years have been teaching, well, it's not sin to drink one beer. Yes, it is sin to drink one beer because the Greek word nepho means sober-minded, free from that which intoxicates. We've got to study the Bible. We've got to know the Bible. Habakkuk chapter 2. Woe unto the man who gives his brother strong drink. And on and on we could go. What about it? immodesty or a better terminology? Biblical nakedness. So he says, Jason, why are you preaching so hard? Because that same 18-year-old boy was 15 or 16. When he began to hear some of this, he never heard the truth much. And he knew that it had to be taught and taught plainly. So someone says, well, there's no, there's no line for modesty. God doesn't give a line. You ever studied the Bible? Listen, 1 Timothy chapter 2, God says, Women, adorn yourself with modest apparel. Now, if he gives a commandment and doesn't tell us through explicit, state, ex, express, express statements, explicit statements or implication how to do it, then he has commanded the impossibility, and that's not possible with God. When he says, Women, adorn, ordain yourselves in modest apparel, it also applies to men, he then expects us to understand what that means. How? Using our minds. Have you ever studied Galatians 5 uh, where it says, it lists all these sins, Galatians 5, and then it says, I think it's about verse 21, and such like. Or Matthew 15 where Jesus there talks about all the traditions that they're doing, and he says, and many other such like things you do. He, what he's saying is the principles, you should be able to take the principles and understand what we're talking about. Well, let me just give you an example. Genesis chapter 3, they made themselves um, coverings for their loins. We call it a modern bathing suit. But then in verse 21, God said, that ain't going to work. He gave them coats of skins. Hebrew language, a garment from the shoulder to the knee, which corresponds with what's taught in the book of Exodus about priests who are in the undergarments, the linen breeches, King James the breeches, uh, if you will, were to go from the loins to the thigh, by implication the end of the thigh, the same word used for shank of the candlestick, which is that long, basically your long knee bone that goes all the way down to your knee, your thigh bone. And he said they're covered it up. And in Isaiah, even though he's dealing with a prophecy, he talks about some who have their thighs exposed, and he says that it's, and it's called their nakedness. We got people running around, go to the beaches with, I don't I have a problem going to the beach, but I have a problem going to the beach if you're among, among naked people, and you're out there wearing things or among them. Because how is that any different? How is that not a violation of 1 Thessalonians where he says, abstain from every appearance of evil? Or Romans 12, we're a living sacrifice. Friends, we have got to teach our children better than this. For too long, we've had little girls raised up in the church, and the preacher will preach on this stuff, and then the elders and the deacons get on to the preacher for saying that they shouldn't have cheerleaders on Friday night kicking their little naked legs up in front of people in the community, and they'll fire the preacher and send him down the road. Let me tell you something. That is a way to go to hell. We can't abide by this any longer. It's not been preached on. Someone says, I don't know if I believe that. You don't have to believe it, but you better be able to answer the question, what is biblical nakedness and what is immodesty? And you better have a standard for it. What about dancing? I, I didn't know all this when I was growing up. What, what do you mean dancing? Listen, can you dance? Well, I can dance with my wife at the house by myself. 
I can even, in a very generic way, at a football game, I go, yay, Aggies. That's dancing. But that's not the kind of dancing we're talking about. When you get in and study the words in Romans 1, Colossians 3, Galatians 5, there are, there are these lists of sins. And you become and you read about words, lasciviousness, revelings. Well, what do these words mean? They're in, they're in the New Testament. Well, you look them up in dictionaries, uh, biblical dictionaries, and you see words for lasciviousness like unchaste handling of males and females, indecent bodily movements, bodily movements that incite lust in others. Whoa, that sure sounds a lot like modern dancing. Revelings, dancing, and drinking parties. You, you, we've got to study. Now, you may not know some of this. You know what you can do? Fix it. Don't justify it. Fix it. Brethren, all I'm trying to say is this. If God's word, if God's word is the simple standard that will judge us, and if the authority of the scriptures demands submission, brethren, we better know what the scriptures teach. We have got to know what the scriptures teach. And I know I've got to close this thing down, but let me just close it like this. Just think about an airplane. Please uh, take your trays and put them in an upright position and put your seat backs. Okay, we ain't there yet, but we're coming in. You make us see a little bit of land down there. <laughs> One time an old preacher was preaching, and he said he, he'd eat too much fried chicken before he got to preach. He said he never could get the plane off the ground. Well, I drank some coffee, so I got it off the ground. I just got to land it. Y'all can smile. I ain't going to hurt you. We have to read the Bible. First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 4.13. Give yourself to reading. We have to study the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. You should be ashamed if you can't rightly divide it. That's what he said. So we read, we study, we meditate. Psalm 1-2, upon thy law do I meditate day and night. We not only read and study and meditate, we have to keep it. 1 John chapter 2 says that, that uh, and hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says he loves God and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We have to then preach and teach it. What does 2 Timothy 4.2 say? 2 Timothy 4.2. Oh, don't you, can't you hear those old preachers? Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You want to know what a good preacher is? Go read uh, 1 Timothy 4 sometimes, and it says a good teacher, a good preacher is one that brings the brethren in remembrance of the true doctrine of Christ. Y'all have a good man here. I hope you realize that. Brother Mornay and Brother Aaron are good men. I've been around them. They're good, sound men. I hope that I'm the same, but let me tell you something, brethren. I'm saying all these things because I love you, and I want you to go to heaven. And I know what my Bible says in Revelation 3.19. Someone may say, Jason, I don't, I don't like all that hard preaching, that hellfire and brimstone preaching. What does that even mean? You know, sometimes one time people do, I don't like it when you have a loud voice. Well, don't read Revelation because there's lots of loud voices going off. I'm not even loud compared to some preachers. But all I'm trying to say is this. What does, again, Revelation 3.19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Had a preacher one time, got up in the pulpit. <laughs> I would never forget it. He's passed on now. He's a good man. I think he probably just a bad statement. But he got an older man. He got up in the pulpit. He said, well, brethren, as far as I can tell, calling names does no good. My wife said my ears turn red in the pew. You know why they turn red? Because all these scriptures are going off in my head. <laughs> That's like the buzz. Beep, beep. I'm making all kinds of sounds tonight. It was going off. Here's what was going off in my mind. Here's a man, a good man. Who said, well, as far as I can tell, calling names does no good. He's talking about calling denominational names or false teachers or whatever. And we don't do it as a hobby or all the time. That wouldn't be the whole counsel of God. But my mind was doing this as he was saying this. I was thinking, really? Then why, when you read First and Second Timothy, is Paul calling all kind of names? Alexander the coppersmith, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Demas, all these names. And then you get to Revelation 2 and 3, and Jesus is calling out the Nicolaitans. He's calling, calling out Jezebel. I'm thinking about Elijah on Mount Carmel, where King Ahab says, Elijah, are you the one that troubles Israel? And Elijah says, me, you're the troubler of Israel. I'm thinking about Micaiah in 1 Kings 22. They're dragging him out. He's preaching the word of God. You've got to get the Bible in you, brethren. We've got to get it in us and keep it in us if we're going to make it to heaven. 
on every issue. I know I've shot out a lot of things today that, that are all sermons. But the elders should go to the preacher and say, listen, man, preach a whole sermon on dancing. Preach a whole sermon on drinking. Preach a whole sermon on gambling. Preach a whole sermon on fornication, sexual sins outside of marriage, homosexual, heterosexual, bestiality. Someone said, bestiality, it's already happening in Canada. We need to preach the whole word of God. Elders, I'm an elder. Exodus, I mean, uh, 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 Ezekiel 34. Woo Ezekiel 34, shepherds, he says, you better not be feeding yourself. You better be feeding the flock. And so I want to say this as we close. And I'm closing. Acts, because I know I got to. A Acts chapter 20. Let's close with this. Acts chapter 20. Very quickly. Get over there. Acts chapter 20. We had a brother drive a long way tonight. And if I don't preach the gospel, he'll call my wife. Exodus chapter 20. I want you to notice verse number 27. Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all, all the counsel of God. Preach on heaven, preach on hell, preach on joy, preach on love, preach on false teeth. Preach it all. That's what he's saying. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. He says he's purchased the church with his own blood. Brother Gallagher is going to talk about Jesus shedding his blood for the church. And then he goes down to verse 32 and says, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace which is able to build you up, give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. But go back to verse 20. He says, And how I kept back nothing that was profit profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance, change your mind, change your heart, change your life. Toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. He then says, I don't know, I'm not worried about what happens to me when I go to Jerusalem. Verse 24, But none of these things move me. Now, it would make me sad if you're mad at me because I don't like people to be mad at me, but it wouldn't make me sad in another way because at the end of the day, I'm not preaching to please you. And again, here's that bell going off again. Woe unto you and all men speak well of you. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm trying to preach the gospel. But I want you to notice verse 26. Wherefore, I take you to record this day, brethren, listen. I am pure from the blood of all men. I believe with all of my heart, mind, and soul, the Lord built His church that we can be and are members of it and that we have to live different from the world because if we live like the world, the world won't want to be in the church. Don't ever give up the faith. And if you're wrong, fix it. We love you. Thank you. Amen. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to buckle up, and we're going to get another amazing.